Welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. Today, I'm honored and privileged to host Sean Aston for a conversation about mental health resources, advocacy, and support. Sean, someone who's probably known to all, if not, or many, if not all of you, but I'm going to go ahead and give him a really brief introduction. So Sean Aston is an American film actor, director, voice artist, producer, who's best known for his roles in films like the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Goonies, of course, Rudy, and also in the Netflix Hicks series, Stranger Things 2. He's the son of Academy Award-winning actress Patty Duke and acclaimed actor John Aston. He's also won several different awards. The uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy garnered eight or 11, excuse me, 11 Academy Awards. Um, and Sean also has taken home awards for, uh, he had a Saturn Award for Best Supporting Actor, awards from the Las Vegas Film Critics Society, the Seattle Film Critics, the Utah Film Critics Association, and the Phoenix Film Critics Society. So obviously someone who's talented in his in his field and in his vocation. Um, he's also a long distance runner, has been a long distance runner since his teens. And in 2012, actually launched a Twitter campaign, hashtag run third, as a way to dedicate his runs to causes and ideas that matter not only to him, but to others as well. Uh, he's a UCLA graduate who has served on the board of several different national nonprofit organizations, including the National Center for Family Literacy. He's a vocal advocate for literacy, mental health awareness, bipolar disorder, civic engagement, and several other issues. So I'm honored to welcome Sean Aston to the Addy Hour podcast. Thanks so much for being here. It was so nice to hear you read all that. I just made it feel so, I don't know, substantial somehow. That's that's nice. Thank you for that. It is substantial. Substantial and real. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. It's real. But definitely appreciate, you know, all the work that you've done over the years in so many different spheres, not just in terms of, obviously, your talent um, on screen and off screen, but also just the way you've been a real advocate for mental health. And I know there's a story there that we'll get into as well. Um, but as my listeners know, I often just like to check in and kind of see how my guests are doing in the midst of everything that we're facing in this ever-changing world and emerging, trying to emerge from COVID. So I just wanted to start there and see how you're doing these days overall. Well, thank you for that. As uh, if people are watching this, I'm currently sitting in a little um, cottage in Sweden and uh, they're any, at any moment, I, I fully expect one of these big, uh, they're like cruise ships that go by. They're not, well, they're like dinner cruise, but they're the size of big cruise ships. Um, I am back to life. I would say, you know, I went and made a movie in Louisiana and in the film industry, there's all sorts of COVID protocols that films take. Um, and, but it was weird. It was definitely weird to do that first sort of, you know, I, I was at the airport with crowds and in the airport shuttle to the rental car with, you know, crowded buses and just thinking what, you know, what has happened to my consciousness? This is, mm. this is, it's not just fear of, um, you know, of, get, of getting COVID. It's, it's also my relationship, all of our relationship to each other and to the outside mm. world. And so that was a, a culture shock after a year and a half. And then, then when I came back, my wife and kids are like, you can't come in yet. You have to stay next door. You don't have to get like an Airbnb for a few days so you can be tested. And so I did that. And now I'm over here doing these um, conventions that are like autograph, um, you know, science fiction, uh, fantasy, comic book, you know, Comic-Con kind of conventions. Right, right. So there are, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be and I did it in Sweden and then I'm going to do uh, Wales. So I don't know. I feel like the treadmill has started back up. I'm back on it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting this uh, master's in uh, public administration, public policy from American University, and I am spending all of my uh, discretionary time on, on, you know, reading and studying and quizzes and uh, midterms and all that. So life is good. Life is good. It's the best is that I'm able to, like, get outside and do long walks and stuff. So right. but yeah, it's, it's hard. The hardest part is family, is managing mm -hmm um family but everybody seems to be in a mode you know the 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 middle kid is um so i've got three daughters ali elizabeth and bella ali lives with her boyfriend and they have their own place now they were with us for a long time during covid mm. and then they got their own place and then the uh, elizabeth is still at home she's at pepperdine and she's mm -hmm. still at home so wait i'm figuring any minute that'll be both she and the youngest one who's 16 are at home so it's going to be amazing to see what happens when we're no longer living in a submarine environment, you know, mm -hmm. where you just, uh, where you're outside of our cohort. Um, and I, I, who knows what that holds in store, but life is good. Long answer to a short question. I appreciate that honesty and just taking us through that journey too. 
I mean, it sounds like some of it's pacing too, you know, as you know, the family's kind of all been together, I'm assuming more often than before from the way that you've characterized it, but even as you're emerging, uh, yeah. kind of, I actually, it. for a long time, I would mourn the end of COVID because it would mm. likely mean that we'd never spend that kind of close time together ever again. Mm. Um, so in that sense, as a father who, and a, and a guy who traveled around yeah. uh, all, you know, so many weeks out of the year, the idea that I, I kind of liked it, mm. you know, I kind of, I kind of liked it, but you can, you can tell that the long-term impact is not ultimately healthy. We, we, mm. you know, they, they have to be with friends and they have to be, we all have to be with friends. We all have mm -hmm. to move our bodies around and, and, um, but it's, you know, we know our personalities now so well, you know, we, you can almost yeah. do like hand, hand gestures or a little facial, you know, like, Oh, that one just came down. And, you know, you can tell that, that, you know, they're in a the mood, leave them alone, you know, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did that catch you off guard? Do you think you have a, like you and your family have more of an appreciation for that now, or was that something that you think was always there and just kind of continued? Well, they, they all had their ecosystem. Mm. And I would come in and out of the ecosystem mm -hmm. based on my travels and, and all the work I was doing. Yeah. So I definitely felt their, 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 their little cocoon expanded to include me during it. Mm. Um, but then in a, in a weird way, you know, I started doing from home work with my union you know, Zoom kind of made lots of things possible that weren't possible beforehand. So yeah. I, I I applied to uh, American University. I started doing this thing. And in a weird way, we kind of like went to our mental neutral corners anyway. Yeah. Even even though we were, uh, I wanted to learn the guitar. So I'd be upstairs, nice. you know, with the door closed playing guitar. And it's amazing after 10,000 hours of guitar playing how bad I still am. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very patient, you know, they'll come up That's to go to bed. Good. And I'm like, well, you got to listen to this song. You know, they're like, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that song right now. <laughs> um, but no, we, we, for a while when COVID started, we all ate sort of like regular meals together mm -hmm. with normal people, but then we kind of all live like we're in a fish tank or, you know, like we all just kind of graze and do what we're doing. So yeah. I, we're sort of back. it's amazing how we've, we've settled back into like where we were beforehand in a lot of, in a lot of yeah. ways. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you all were flexible too. I mean, you kind of readjusted in this moment. Well, we were lucky. We were lucky. Yeah. And I, I will forever be grateful for mm -hmm. our particular circumstance mm -hmm. in this sort of thing. You can see the rhythms mm -hmm. of your day and your week and your month. You can see your family rhythms. You can see your own psychological rhythms. You know, why on one day am I feeling totally claustrophobic uh, and like I have to get out? I mean, there's no reason to. To, but uh, and other days, no, there's, you know, we want to go for a drive just to get a sense of what's going on in the outside world. So mm -hmm. like we're in the Mars rover and we're going out to explore, you know, and and like what, how do we, you know, no one got hurt physically. I wondered about that a lot. Like mm -hmm. what happens if somebody falls down the stairs or cuts themselves or mm -hmm. has some other, you know, breaks a tooth or I don't know, something like it's been a, a blessing that nobody's been really injured over the course of the time. But because of that, we've basically been in this little behavioral experiment. Mm. And, you know, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we'll be unpacking it for the rest of our lives. I, as our family member, I've been the sort of first to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and they, <laughs> You know, we have this long talk about like, you're going to go into this movie and then you're going to come back and you're going to be like, there's no such thing as COVID. Let's just keep going. I'm like, probably because it was in the South where I was working, but, mm. but they, uh, but I said, no, you know, of course I'll be respectful and it's all about mm. masks and all doing what we're supposed to do. But when I came back, I started looking at them and judging them a little mm. bit. Wow. Like you guys, you can't, your, your, your paradigm is you're in a locked paradigm. That's not in your own interest. You've wow. got to break out of it. And they, and then there was like this, this civil war in that, this, this cold civil war in our house about, you know, whether, what, what it's time to do and, and not do, but I, you know, I'm taking this economics class and I'm mm -hmm. we're supposed to like come up with, uh, you know, things in everyday life that reflect some of the economics, you know, principles that we're studying. 
And one of the things is like my whole life, I've, as a, as a parent, it's been about saving money for their college. Mm. That's been my, my life. So save money for college, save money for college. And uh, we've been lucky to do it. Some years we couldn't, other years we could. But by the time the first one, by the time Allie got ready to go to college, we've, we've been able to kind of be there. But now that Elizabeth is in her second year at Pepperdine, her whole first year virtual, mm. and you're looking at this bucket of money that you worked so hard to save over two decades, basically, and you go, boy, I've never thought of it this before. But you're like, boy, I could just park that money in a house. I just buy her a house. And somehow, and, and you, you, so you start looking at like, what are, she joined a sorority, mm. but she, she knew that it wasn't okay that we we're so segregated from people. Mm. So she did it as a way to make sure that she had mm -hmm. this virtual community so that yeah. when we come out of it, she'll be able to go back into it, which is just very sensible. But it seemed to me that that activity, that discretionary activity that is so outside of her normal mm -hmm. mode is the thing that's worth not buying the house for. Mm. I want her to go to college, but my, my worldview has, has, mm -hmm. you know, just paused to allow other things to come yeah. into it. What do we value? Why do we value it? What, what does the opportunity cost of doing that forego? You know? Yeah. So anyhow, um, <laughs> they're very patient with me, <laughs> my wife <laughs> But yeah, right. and I hope I hope everybody is going through those kinds of evaluations in their mind. I think it wakes people up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think I just think. having that awareness like you mentioned too of all the different values that we have and I think it's given us another way to actually look at those in the mirror and think about what our values and what our worldview are, you know. Cuz even as you mentioned when you left and came back it seemed like there was a shift there. There's a little bit of a riffle. I mean, obviously we could, you know, we could get into that, just all the different covert perspectives and different pockets of the country, but then just, you know, even that you caught yourself in that like judging mode. Like, we, oh, the film that doing? I did, yeah. the, the crew all has to be double vaxxed. Mm -hmm. The crew has to all wear masks. Anybody that's interacting with actors because mm -hmm. actors have makeup on that the masks can smudge and mm -hmm. mess up. So uh, they have to be, they have to have the masks and the uh, shield. Okay. You know, they're, yeah, so they're not, there's, there's all, you know, people are having temperature checks in the morning. There was all of these like super rigorous controls. Yeah. But the second I stepped outside and I didn't have a mask on, it was like, boop, no yeah. time. <laughs> I was gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly what happens. So, I mean, it's that, it's that tension too between, because I mean, so the other thing is you were there, I assume you didn't get sick. It would no, be a I different scenario sick. if something had happened, you caught COVID, and then how that could have also changed your worldview. And I think some of that has also played out in a lot of ways, too. My brother and I were talking because mm -hmm. I'm in Sweden now, and no one in Sweden wears masks. Mm. No one. Mm -hmm. So I'm interacting with, say, a thousand people, right? Or, or directly, you know, I mean, you're in a hall where there's right, right. 10,000 people, but directly interacting with a couple hundred, maybe. Mm -hmm. And he's interacting with, like, six people. But he's like, if I get COVID, if Sean gets COVID because he was interacting with people, it's justifiable because he was making money. If mm -hmm. I get COVID because I was visiting my friends, then it was just, it was a discretionary like error or something. So there's these kinds of psychological uh, like games that yeah. you play with yourself that, yeah. that go into, um, you know, in, in economics, there's this thing, they call it uh, homo economicus. Uh, and that's the ideal rational actor, the, the, mm, yeah. the, the entity that will make whatever interest, not going to tip at a restaurant because mm -hmm. it's not in that person's interest, mm. unless you have a different value system. So you, you just start realizing like, what, you know, what is our obligation to each other? Yeah. What is our, what is our obligation to each other to, um, and how we, you know, the only kind of leadership, the best kind of leadership to me is the only kind of leadership that's by example. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you set an example that, you know, doesn't line up with the stated. 
yeah value system, you know? there's, there's so many layers to that too because like your own perspective about justifying why you're doing what you're doing versus what other people are thinking versus on what the outcomes like you and your brother kind of depended on you know if you gotten COVID, if he had gotten COVID, different perspectives on the outcomes of justification like all that kind of all mixed together i think that can it's good for us to then i have then i have all of these people. friends mm-hmm. uh or you know i i the, the, there's there's different threads that i'm on Mm-hmm. And on one of these threads that I'm on with a lot of very intelligent, very, you know, well-educated people, mm-hmm. there's a, uh, a, a steady drumbeat of um, antagonism towards public policy with regard mm-hmm. to COVID mm-hmm. and the, the, the memes and the videos yeah. and the, yeah. uh, the things that come through. Uh, they're all smart people, these people I'm describing who are putting it forward. So there's always like some element in what's being conveyed that gives you pause. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I go back to my team and I'm like, hey, hon, what do you think of this? And they're like, wow, well, you can't, you can't give any. <laughs> and you're like, well, what are we allowed to discuss? You know, what is it? What is a conspiracy? You know, conspiracy theory is something that any two or three people come up with. You know, what, when, when is it bad and when is it, you know, like prudent? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So, and it's hard to find yeah. the truth beneath everything, too. With all the, I mean, so how, you know, how quickly someone can just say something that goes viral that somehow becomes truthful, even though it's completely non-factual and just <laughs> navigating through that whole. And, and the, the mental strain mm-hmm. that it puts on people of goodwill mm-hmm. trying to navigate yeah. Uh, yeah. those decisions and those emotions and those, yeah. uh, you know, particularly when you have people that you're responsible for. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to, to um, rebuilding a society Mm -hmm. a a mental society yeah yeah where we can you know relate with each other just takes um commitment and focus and and i think and it's exhausting yeah and i know you've talked about that before too how you see mental health as the biggest challenge that we have as a nation especially coming out of the pandemic so and you and and just thinking about you know some of the things you've done the community like what if what's been your idea of ways to kind of help people move through that because it is, you know, a lot of people kind of talked about the second wave Mm -hmm. being kind of the mental health crisis, not that the crisis wasn't there before, but just the additional strain of all the isolation and there's the fear factor. Well, maybe it's maybe, maybe the COVID has made it easier for people to have a mental health discussion Mm -hmm. because uh, on some macro level, I hope, Mm -hmm. um, because Nobody did anything, quote unquote, wrong. Mm. A lot of times in the stigma game, Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of starting to talk about one's mental health Mm -hmm. um, connotes failure or, you know, Mm. that that it it means that you've, um, uh, you know, that that there's been some bad behavior, bad thinking, bad Mm. choices, bad, I don't know what, but that, that, in some way you are responsible, not just for like, you know, the decisions you make and the ramifications of your decisions, but Mm -hmm. you're responsible for the very nature of whether or not you're healthy, your food Mm -hmm. choices, your exercise, your sleep Mm -hmm. regimen, all, all those kinds of things that go into, that go into health. But there's, you know, that's, that stigma. I, now everybody is allowed to talk about, Mm -hmm. wow, what does it mean that you did nine, you know, 18 months, differently than anyone in society for the last couple hundred years, even through world wars, nothing mm-hmm. happened like this. I asked my father, if he remembered the depression, he's 91. Mm-hmm. And he said, he remembered it very well. He remembered bread lines. His dad was a scientist, mm-hmm. but he remembered certain things. And I said, what's worse that or this? He said, this by a mile. He goes, wow. he goes, you, you, when someone was in trouble during the depression, you mm-hmm. could help them. Mm-hmm. Now the best thing you could do to help somebody was stay away from them. Mm-hmm. So that paradigm is yeah. uh, in, inhuman. It's not, it's not human. When else in human history? I mean, there have been other plagues and other, mm-hmm. um, you know, mass health events and stuff. But on this scale, uh, you know. Um, so, but any, anyhow, I, what do I do? In a weird way, I, you know, Lord of the Rings may be the biggest thing I ever do. I do a lot of other things mm-hmm. like specific to giving talks and right. my, my organization and stuff like that. But 
But people, you know, there's there's a great speech in the two towers. And Sam's looking out and he goes, it's like in the great tales, Mr. Frodo. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go on the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass and a new day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. Those are the stories that stayed with you that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good left in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. One of the greatest speeches ever in the history of, you know, drama or, or whatever. I was so lucky I got to be the one to say that. Mm. Um, and, you know, when you, when I'm giving talks, mental health speeches to mental health organizations, which I do all the time, um, something about relating my direct personal experience mm-hmm. uh, and reflecting the direct personal experience of people in the audience um, often people will ask questions and that's great because then you can engage a little bit like that. Um, there's a sense of, uh, security that people feel. There's a sense of relief that people feel not to be alone in a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll do that speech or then we'll play a little bit of that speech or something like that. And you realize that like, there, you know, in and of itself, that speech is powerful. I've had thousands, literally thousands of people Mm. over 20 years tell me, well, let's say hundreds at the least say, you know, it saved their life and it got them through a dark time in their life that they, that, you know, it gave, gave them inspiration. It gave them hope to go on. And it, 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 it gives that speech gives a a prescription, Mm. you know, there is good. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is there good? Isn't there good? Well, in that idea, there, the concept, there is good and it's worth fighting for. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my mental health uh, kind of uh, exploration is now is kind of graduated into not that it's worth fighting for, but like, how do you fight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so, which is, uh, you know, I've got, I've got solutions. Um, but they're just suggestions that people have to find a, find it for themselves with that movie. And then, um, you know, just, I want my observations about my mother's life and her experience and my life and my experience with my family. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that people are willing to listen a little bit closer because they recognize you from a movie or something. My, that was my mom's mission. Her mission mm-hmm. was to, uh, destigmatize mental health. So, so I, um, so I, I steer into that space mm-hmm. where just uh, people are like, well, I don't know if you're comfortable. Like if I'm comfortable when I was like 12, my mom was saying stuff that you're like, mom, mm-hmm. how could you say like, mm-hmm. you didn't get permission before you told that anecdote, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, well, you know, and, and I'm sorry on the one hand, but then people come up to me later in life saying, you know, your mother's book saved my life. You know, mm-hmm. your mother, her, her, her fight, her, mm-hmm. her tenacity, her, um, you know, her moxie basically is, it gave them inspiration. And yeah. so, you know, at a time when people weren't really talking about it much, at least in her profession. Well, the profession itself had advanced to a certain level at mm. that point. Okay. Her, her diagnose. I mean, if you think when she got diagnosed as a, I think it was, was it called manic depression then now it's mm-hmm. called bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there was something else. There was another one too. Um, she was afraid of like padded rooms and straight jackets and electroshock therapy mm-hmm. and being ostracized and being given Thorazine. And like in her mind, when you're mentally unwell, you go away. Mm-hmm. So the, the vocabulary, the science, the, the psychopharmacology had all you know met her where she was mm-hmm. at, in her forties. And then she decided to just kind of like pick up this flag, like on the battlefield and just start waving it around because she was so grateful Mm. that um, she also saw it as a success strategy for herself. Mm. That if she took ownership of her diagnosis and her Mm -hmm. treatment and her, 
you know, her, her journey from places where she behaved very badly uh, in a lot of ways in front of a lot of people mm-hmm. to someone who did that less and less. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, she, if she took ownership of that journey, that um, she would sort of get credit for it. Mm. She would get credit for it from herself, from her family. We were probably the last to give her credit for it because there was a disconnect between yeah. the authority with which she spoke and mm-hmm. the truth of how she lived. And you're right. like, there's a gap there. Yeah. But it didn't matter to the people who she was communicating with. They were they were inspired. And mm-hmm. so, but but that that sort of empowerment track that mm-hmm. she was on, I think, um, uh, was in terms of Larry King was always uh, was, you know, the first cable news kind of nighttime news anchor. I mean, you'd had uh, you have Peter Jennings and Dan uh, Rather and mm-hmm. the other guy, but uh, who are your kind of like, you know, male, white of a certain age, you mm-hmm. know, disseminating the news during the week to let you know that the world was okay and, you know, or whatever. So, but Larry King was the first like talk show guy to do those sorts mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. issues, uh, war and, and stuff. And every time something would happen in the mental health space, Muriel Hemingway would be on to deal with alcoholism. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 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 Rosalind Carter would come on to talk about depression. Mm -hmm. And my mom was there to talk about bipolar. Mm -hmm. And they were there, you know, now we're all into seeing panels of speakers on TV, but at the time they were doing it, that was pretty rare. So she was, you know, if somebody, it was usually in response to something horrible that would happen, a shooting or something like that, Mm -hmm. but she she would get a third of the time to Mm -hmm. respond to those issues. And she educated herself well enough, you know, Mm -hmm. lay lay person's education about it, but, you know, sufficient to impress psychiatric Institute of America who gave her Mm -hmm. a big award and uh, pharmaceutical companies who Mm -hmm. had her, you know, work with them and stuff. So I do have my, you mentioned the run third Mm -hmm. uh, running thing. We ended up creating a nonprofit called the run third Alliance. Mm -hmm. That's how you and I met because um, we, it had to go virtual. It's a 5k. It's a, it's a, it's a series of after school running programs for elementary school kids. Um, So fifth, sixth graders, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth graders Mm -hmm. who uh, just a little bit of a very low cost uh, structured after school experience that, that, you know, running, that's just so good for kids to get that mm-hmm. physical energy and, yeah. and, uh, and then to connect them conceptually, like with their parents a little bit, and then with the community abroad. And then it culminates in a, in a 5k run at the, uh, it's in Mesa, Arizona. We have like 10 schools, 12 schools in Mesa, Arizona. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, Red Mountain High is the, is on their football field. We set up one of those 5k balloon things and nice, we bring nice. people we get all kinds of sponsors to come out and it's it's a beautiful thing so we had to go uh, virtual because of the because of covid and it occurred to us as we were trying to figure out like you know the fundraiser to be ready to i mean all the programs just folded when the closes yeah. shut up it's yeah. like okay well now nah. so do, do we want them to come back online we don't really have the infrastructure set up for that we need money to be able to do it so, but as we were putting together the virtual 5K, it just became clear that um, one of the things we could use the moment for was to engage these families, mm-hmm. uh, mostly lower income families, uh, with mental health um, concepts. And so, um, you know, when my mom died, right after she died, I, I cooked up this idea of the mental health, Patty Duke Mental Health Project. Mm-hmm. Um, we never raised enough money to actually be able to launch it as a proper instrument, legal instrument, but we raised some money and mm-hmm. I was like, well, let's put some money towards facilitating a little um, dialogue with these. And if not a dialogue, but like, how can we flow resources to these yeah. folks? Yeah. Um, and so we, and I really appreciated the fact that you can't talk to us about how to think about some of that. So those are the, you know, sp- mental health speeches, which I do a lot. Um, and those and that little thing that I just described are the kind of big ticket things that I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's definitely appreciated. I mean, I was thinking back to something you said earlier about just a shift. It's almost like people have more permission to talk about it because, you know, you talked about when people were before it's a lot of times saying, what did you do wrong? You know, this happened to you. You're at fault. Have you noticed that 
is that openness still there when you're engaging the community with the run through alliance when you're talking to or there's still some pushback like how do you navigate that as someone who grew up with someone who struggled with mental health and saw kind of both sides of that i don't want to report what i think i see mm. <laughs> What I think I see are, um, I think there are, the resources that are available to people are mm. so much more than people realize. Mm. There are some great resources. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if people are in need, uh, everyone is in need, but if, but if uh, to some extent or other, but you know, if it gets to a point where people feel like they need to, you know, talk to a counselor or, you know, you know seek some sort of a diagnosis or something like mm -hmm. that, the, if they ask a little bit, there are routes to, you know, they'll get routed mm. to places where they might be able to get something that they can afford. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause a lot of time there's people are worried about the expense of mm -hmm. that sort of thing, you know, but, um, I mean, she's, I haven't really tried it, but that Michael Phelps promoted thing mm -hmm. about talk therapy now kind of a mm -hmm. thing. You're like, mm -hmm. well, that's, there you go. That's a lot of times what mostly what, you know, what people need at least to start is to yeah. talk to somebody. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but I see antagonisms, mm developing along the lines of how people are coming out of COVID. Mm. Wow. And I, and I see it making people's communication a little fragile. Mm. Um, so I think we could do well to start, you know, I, I had a friend come to LA from New York and he was, he was clearly kind of back in the saddle. Mm -hmm. You know, some, some people are just, you know, a lot of them, I mean, look, stadiums of people are going to, you know, yeah. like the, the country is back for, you mm -hmm. know, in a, in a serious way. Yeah. Um, but you know, people's mentality is still there. So yeah. he came out and I kept saying, you know, listen, my, the way my wife and kids are, mm -hmm. they don't want me to, you know, go, go mix and mingle in the world and then come back into their like protected bubble. Mm -hmm. And he, this is my good friend. And he like, couldn't, he couldn't work with it for a while until mm -hmm. I kind of said it forcefully. I'm like, look, it will be upsetting to them. If I do that, if I come mm -hmm. meet you on somewhere mm -hmm. outside with Matt, whatever. And it's, it's so I, and he, he finally was like, okay, I totally understand. That's fine. But there was a, there was, we did have to navigate yeah. that little space. And I wasn't even the one who was worried about it. Mm -hmm. So I then had to turn around. I had the static with him. And then I had to turn around to my guys and be like, listen, you guys, this is the environment that people are operating in. So now behaving responsibly mm -hmm. at the extreme end that you're wanting to is, you know, has consequences and we, and we, we have to understand what those consequences are. And they, they want to challenge them too. They want, you know, they want friends, they want school, they want a lot of things, but, but I, I just noticed that there's a look in, a, a kind of furtive look in people's mm -hmm. eyes mm -hmm. when they ask questions about, uh, you know, what's going on post COVID. And, and I, it makes me sad because I'm, you know, I don't know if I'm an empath in the like clinical sense of it or the whatever metaphysical sense of it, but I'm very in tune with mm -hmm. what people are thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, God, I remember, I remember when there was a, in 1992, after the verdict within the Rodney King trial mm -hmm. and the LA riots started, the 92 LA riots started, I remember driving to the grocery store and we were like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's get some, do a little grocery shopping. Well, because it's going to be a few days probably until this all calms down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get to the grocery store and people in the parking lot were not observing normal rules. They were not behaving normally. They were parking askew. You know, they pull into the parking lot and they'd stop and they'd get out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you get 20 or 30 people who do that. And the yeah. parking lot looks like That's a, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we go in and people are, they're not in a, um, they're not in a panic mode yet, but mm -hmm. there's this simmering yeah. feeling. Yeah. And so we got in whatever few little things we weren't going to like, you know, hoard or anything, but the few things we got, we, we get in line and we're standing there and the person checking out, the items is not looking up mm -hmm. or is just only looking up to the extent they need to. And I could see the person's name was, I don't know, Tom or something. Like that. I'm like, mm -hmm. Hey Tom, how you doing, man? How are things going? And he looked up and he was, and you could feel mm -hmm. everyone around settled. 
Somebody talked normal. Wow. Somebody, you know, there was a, there was still a sense of like, we know things aren't right, mm -hmm. but how are you is a question about normalcy. Yeah. And we're okay. You know, we're holding it together reinforces the idea of social cohesion. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so with that this community. current moment, this thing that I'm noticing is like people's preset mm -hmm. is something negative or at least skeptical. Yeah. And so it's a little bit of like a, an emotional barrier that you have to yeah. climb over. It's fast. It's subtle. You can't really, you mm -hmm. know, to the untrained eye, you might not know what's going on. <laughs> but uh, but I, I just figure that, you know, Thanksgiving is coming in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know when this when your listeners are going to hear this or Christmas, the holiday seasons mm -hmm. season. And, you know, it's it's bad enough if you're one you know, if one uncle's a Republican and the other one's a Democrat and you just know like, oh, my God, they're just going to be going on that, you know, and so forth. Um, but now everyone, most people can just get away in those social settings of saying like, you know, well, I don't really talk about politics or, uh, you know, uh, you know what? I haven't really paid much attention to it or oh, it's, uh, they're all the same anyway. Or you, know, you can you can you know, it's there's safe harbor in yeah. dismissiveness. But when it comes to covid. Yeah. Everybody's got a <laughs> yeah, it's a device. And I think you're right, because everybody's riding. I mean, like you talked about with the, the king, Rodney King, it's, there's just a level of tension and anxiety that everybody's riding. I think it's a there's a huge variety in how much people or how much we're willing to acknowledge that in our interactions. So I think some of us are very keenly aware that it's there and it's affecting how we interact and navigate in the world. And some of us aren't as keenly aware and are just kind of seeing the outcome of it. In those in there. and then things just kind of boil over, boil over. So, like you were talking about, I mean, just that community aspect, just taking time to step back and say, "How are you?" And just, you know, just those little things makes a huge difference because um, it's you know this is kind of a, share, a unique shared experience in a sense. Well, I feel like these kind of conversations, and I don't even know what other forms it takes, but it takes time to think through a process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. There, everybody's got other stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So to help, to give people tools, like, hey, if you find yourself in this situation, mm -hmm. here's a way, you know, the, this is what's at stake and here are some possible ways for you to navigate it. Yeah. Um, you know, in the economics and behavioral economics is this last chapter we've been looking at and, and there's all these kinds of prompts, they call them nudges. You know what nudges are? Nudges in society, things like um, um, if the default setting at your work is that you're opted into a savings plan where they withhold savings mm -hmm. or you're opted in already to you're not opted in your you're, the default setting is you're um, participating right. in some health care plan or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. so you have to choose not to do it. People, our behavioral tendencies mm -hmm. Are if we were more aware of them in the ways that I'm learning about in these classes I'm taking, yeah. I think we might uh, we might people should just know that there are th thinking has been done along the lines of what most of us are th uh, feeling and thinking, mm -hmm. and it's not that far away to be able to access that thinking. You don't That's have fair. to read the whole book. You don't have to listen to the whole audiobook. You don't have mm -hmm. to, you know, fully go there. There's there there are ways to, because people are impatient, mm. you know, and yeah. and um, where people choose to put their intention, their their, you know, the the, the substance of their life, the, the the what they do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we could all, you know, the seatbelt light. If you don't put your seatbelt on there's an actual light that goes off that tells yeah. you and a sound and they make it mandatory. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, you know, the, the, so, you know, and the death rate in the public policy of doing that drives it down. Mm -hmm. Like what is there in the mental health space that could be a blinking light that mm -hmm. lets you know, like, Oh, actually you're going to cause a lot less expense to the healthcare system. If you, you know, get a good night's sleep or mm -hmm. you, you know, you eat a sandwich when you're, when you're hungry and you don't let yourself spiral out of control because the truth is you're hungry, you know, yeah. like, yeah. um, 
So, I think that, that's the uh, that's the key question, and I think they were still trying to figure out the best way to do that. I mean, I think part of it is having people like you who are sharing honestly, you know, about what you experienced growing up and trying to put that in front of a lot of different audiences. People had lived experiences, making sure they share, but really to kind of get it ingrained, I think that's the key piece. Because it's funny, you know, as you're talking about the sleep. So my dad's actually a sleep physician, and he came on you know, this podcast a couple episodes back and was just talking about some of those things, like how sleep affects your overall health and your mental health and the importance of getting good rhythms and, you know, just some of the little things that can make a huge difference. But if there's a way for us to kind of really have that permeate into society, do you have any ideas? I'm curious. I mean, as someone who well, I mean, thought about this a little bit, my sleep schedule, uh, well, I mean, it being honest with yourself, mm -hmm about what, what's going on in your environment that's actually affecting mm -hmm. those things. I yeah. mean, I, my sleep schedule, I noticed I was like going to sleep at three and four in the morning. Mm. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning tired or I'd wake up at 11, you know, I'd get my six or seven hours. I was just getting them like, at, in, at, and it's not like it was affecting my, I mean, my, I'm, I'm professional. If I have a job and I need mm -hmm. to be up at seven in the morning, you know, I get up at six and mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm fine. But I have one of those jobs as an actor where most of the time I'm actually not working. Mm -hmm. So really it's like, woohoo, what do you want to do with your life? <laughs> and I realized that when that I experienced a certain kind of stress associated with my wife and kids mm -hmm. and when they, everybody would go to sleep, all of a sudden it was like jazz hours. Like this is my time. You know, like this is this is time where you know, and and so I would just you know maybe even just watch movies on TV, you know, like watch mm -hmm. movies. Nothing even you know sometimes the same movie I'd seen ten times, <laughs> but there was some there must have been something about that. And then like when oh my gosh when um, when COVID hit, mm -hmm. I became like a sun worshiper. I would I would set my clock my daily mental clock. Mm -hmm. based on the half hour or I would go out and sit down on the, on the patio furniture or mm -hmm. walk around with my shirt off in the backyard, and like in shorts, like, you know, they're like, dad, what are you doing? You do that's dad. That's not allowed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have my dad cred for sure. For sure. <laughs> but like, I would literally feel so much better mm -hmm. and sleep so much regularly. My, my uh, circ circadian rhythms mm -hmm. when I was like, had a kind of sun, you know, regular sun. Yeah. Um, I then, once we got to a point where I was like, guys, I'm now going to go like for long walks and runs. So we'll get, we can pick a route where you guys are comfortable with it, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to not do that. It's mm -hmm. my, otherwise I, you know, it's just, I'm, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you need me to move out, you're going to kick me out, kick me out, but I'm going for a six mile walk right now. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and we, so we came up with a compromise that worked, but when I would do that, when I would get six, eight, nine, ten 10 miles of a walk in mm -hmm. a day, sleep like a baby mm. eat better mm -hmm. actually i could eat like crap afterwards because i feel like i was and like uh, earn the right justified like crap. It. <laughs> but i you know uh, mental uh, uh, sleep hygiene your dad's mm -hmm. i love he's to sleep you know it's weird here it's it's uh it's 3 30 here so have you seen any have any of the ships gone by yet i haven't seen it yet we have picked the wrong hour to do this because <laughs> in like an hour, these ships, these massive, really cool ships are going to go right by the window, but it gets dark here mm. now, mm. like four by four o'clock within the next half hour, 40 minutes, it's dark. Mm. That's it. That F's with the mind. That's true. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, uh, but there's, I found a, a place where I can park the car, mm -hmm. the, the Swedish, they're so organized. Everything is so well, like, you know, organized, no joke. And the, the, there's these walkways that are really well lit and I can go for like a five mile walk and I'll mm -hmm. go, at, I'll put on my, it's cold out. It's like, you know, 32 degrees out, mm -hmm. but I'll get my, my clothes on. I'll go for a walk and I'm moving one's physical body mm -hmm. outside is a, uh, and, and, and drinking water. Those are my two, you know, some people can take certain drugs, you know, my mom, you know, hers was lithium. She was very religious about it. Mm -hmm. She talked about it, but whatever drug therapy or talk therapy or mm -hmm. whatever people go through as they're building their wellness strategy for themselves, mm -hmm. 
moving and it's hard for people who can't move their bodies. Mm, yeah. It's hard. You know, you know why, like in, in, uh, convalescent homes, they wheel them out, mm -hmm. the patients out to be in the sun for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would just encourage people to find outdoor time doing anything yeah. that you can do. Um, yeah. yeah. And so many pieces I mean. of that too. Cause I mean, your exercise, like the way that exercise impacts the brain, which makes it, you know, easier for us to just kind of navigate through or just be in the sun, having a regular schedule. It sounds like what you've done is just found out what those are for you. You know, for your mom, it might be well, we've, we've isolated talk therapy. Yeah. I, it's, I, I think often about my wife's family in Indiana. Mm. Uh, her father was a firefighter and mm -hmm. uh, a clean operator. Her mom worked in a foundry. Um, these are working class people. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times the conversations about men, it's changed now. Mm -hmm. Now in that community, CVS is right down the street. Everybody knows where to go. They go mm -hmm. to the doctor to get their med. You know, like people are oriented towards it now. Right, I think right. the, the next step in the mental health, uh, you know, game is is for people to start refining their questions and and uh, raising their expectations for mm. what their own uh, you know capabilities are. Mm. Um, and, 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 and managing that, that process. So, um, but yeah, uh, what can I say? The, the, the other thing is uh, to move away from sleep for a second. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion now. I just gave a talk with a group called, I think they were called brain health or something. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the phrase they used? It was so good. It just has to do with language, the vocabulary surrounding mm -hmm. the conversation of mental health, a mm -hmm. mental wellness, a mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I find that one of the things I'm able to do in my speeches, because I just don't care. I mean, I always say at the beginning of my speeches to mental health organizations, mm -hmm. the group, community groups, or whatever, like I'm not a professional. You know, you have to seek your own uh, you know, professional medical yeah. guidance and everything else, but, but I'll speak candidly about what I think and feel. And one of the things that I speak to is I'm very critical of the mental health, um, corporate and the mental health, um, medical community, mm -hmm. because I think the language that is used, mm -hmm. the, the, the general temperament has improved, mm -hmm. I think over the last 25, 30 years where people's, you know, healthcare providers, mental health providers are genuinely interested in contributing mm -hmm. to the wellness of the person. They're not just like dealing with a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but even, even well-intentioned people use phrases that are suppressive. Mm. And if we, you know, you know, people with bipolar disorder in particular, since it's my like area, um, are highly suggestible Mm. And like really highly in tune with judgment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what's being mm -hmm. said. And, you know, if the mind is going a thousand miles an hour, which it's want to do, and you get like a little monkey wrench thrown into it, oof, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So people have to be accountable for their own reactions to what they hear. But when you call someone, there was a word that I haven't heard as much in the last few years, but they were calling people sufferers. Mm a bipolar sufferer. You're like, come on, man, there's just, we got to do better than that. Mm. Because if you're a bipolar, does it, is there, is it like a broken arm? Does it mend? If you, if you have a bipolar mood disorder, is there a fixed stop point mm. or are you being given a death sentence mm. when you're told that you have a bipolar mood disorder? And if you're a bipolar sufferer, well, we have now consigned you to suffering for the rest of your life. Mm. And that is not um, accurate. It's not an accurate thing to do, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I think people might feel like, well, at least someone has empathy. Mm. You know, if you say someone's a sufferer, you go, mm. oh, I don't want you to be suffering. I see that you're suffering. I, I hear you. I feel that you're suffering. I, I want to help take action that can help right. alleviate your suffering. But there's 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 just a conversancy that happens, yeah. and there's like there's optimistic speak, and there's 
yeah, calibrate just the little things. Yeah. 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 I think that's so important that like to have even some of these like back and forth conversations, I think are critical. Cause I mean, to your point, I think, you know, within some of the training circles, people are trying to get away from or trying to pay attention to their own, not that they weren't before, but their own body language and their responses and how that influences people that they're talking with. But I think like just to have this type of a level of con candid conversation is critical because even within the field, you know, there's been a shift from trying to get away from saying you are bipolar, like that defines you. Right. And right. obviously has lots of negative consequences to trying to say, this is something that someone has. But as you pointed out, even that can be a shift. Cause I think people are now trying to say, well, you are struggling. Someone who has bipolar is struggling with bipolar is suffering with bipolar. But then yeah. to your point, if people don't have these conversations, don't even think about what that word suffer does or yeah. how that's being yeah. interpreted by the person. So I feel like this has to be, I don't think it's there enough, but it has to be an ongoing conversation between clinicians, scientists, family members, and those who are, who are well, going I think through one to, of get, the things to get both can, sides to inform it. One of the things yeah. that I think can help is mm -hmm. if people orient themselves mm -hmm. to, the, to the premise that like, people who are having a, an issue mm -hmm. can successfully navigate mm -hmm. the issue. Mm -hmm. There are ways for it to be yeah. there. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, the, the thing that's hard is, is, you know, usually there's uh, when, when the moment at which people talk about focus, think about seek treatment or whatever, there's usually crisis involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, what's interesting to think about, I think is, is to note that like a crisis moment on a timeline does not have to define like mm -hmm. the end yeah. point or even yeah. many of the other points along that, along that continuum. So, yeah. you know, navigate, mm -hmm. you know, mental health challenges, yeah. uh, you know, uh, so the one group was talking about, you know, brain health, that's what they mm -hmm. were called. They were called brain health. Mm -hmm. And they're like, the brain is an organ, like, you know, your heart is an organ. You have to have heart health. You have to have mm -hmm. liver health, kidney health. You have to have brain health. Yep. And, um, so, you know, they're such complex instruments, our brains. What an amazing 100 thing. I agree. What an amazing thing. The, the neurological kind of carnival that's happening. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I'm at an age now where memory, I'm starting to, mm. you know, you know, I'm wondering if I've, if I've topped up, like, that's it. I've capped my memory things. Like, you know, my father's 91. His memory is incredible. He mm -hmm. somehow finds pathways for ideas to mm -hmm. get to names or numbers. You can spit out a number and he can remember numbers, things. But I, I find that my recall, like, so but what the, what's going on? What's going on in the chambers of my mind? Is it, is it starting to atrophy? Is it starting to, you know, I love my studies. Mm -hmm. I love my studies. I mean, my it is so hard. It's so hard. And what I know would have taken me you know, two hours to do in my early twenties is mm. taking me six hours to do mm -hmm. at, now that I'm 50. And I don't know if that's just because I don't know why that is, but I, I, I just marvel at the mm -hmm. human mind and what's, I hope that that technology and medicine is accelerating quickly enough that, I mean, you're young. You're how old are you? I see you got a little great. Not, not as young as, yeah, not as young as I was. So, so I'm 50. So by the time I'm 65, which mm -hmm. is like what retirement, is that officially retirement age or yeah, retirement works. age is older now, <laughs> 70, 72. I don't know. Well, we'll public policy is what I'm studying. Like it doesn't, I'm an actor. We never retire. I'm retired. Every time I finish a job, I'm retired. I'm coming out of retirement because I got another job, but the, um, but I, like, will there be technologies available to help stimulate the mind or help repair mm -hmm. things within the mm -hmm. brain? Uh, if that's something you're working on, let me not distract you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> People are working on it. But to be honest, I mean, some, it's, it's one of those interesting topics because some of the things we're learning shouldn't be surprising in a sense, but people are trying to understand, okay, how does exercise actually impact process? And even all the things, that, you know, being, I don't want to say, not academically, but being just engaged in things deep conversations and, and studies and things like that, just keeping your mind active and all the positive effects that has. I mean, I don't study aging per se, but some of it is just looking at those natural practices, those God-given practices that we know we should do that actually have positive effects for our brains as well. Um, but in that sense, a lot of the research that people are doing are trying to figure out 
what's happening when things go awry. So when, you know, when dementia sits in or Alzheimer's or ways we can kind of prevent some of those processes and things like that. And to be honest, some of the, it's not a complete hundred percent protective effect, but some of those things like exercise and engaging in intellectual activities also seem to have some protective effects. So people are looking into how that's happening. But I mean, that's an open question, whether there'll be, you know, therapeutic interventions or technology to, uh, that's, you know, the age old, age old question of, um, <laughs> Not immortality, well, but kind of keeping our mental faculties in a sense as long as we can. I mean, you know, we there are such dangers mm. associated with having eight and a half billion people on this little blue spinning rock. Mm. You know, there are like our food supply, mm -hmm. our uh, you know, I mean, disease, like we've just been, you know, like these kind of pandemics that you can have, mm -hmm. you know, just the environment, like pollution, you know, all of, there's so many things that are um, really just pressures weighing down on civilization, on mm -hmm. humankind. But one of the awesome things is that really smart people like you <laughs> are working all over the world on coming up with some mm -hmm. of these kinds of um insights and you know therapies and and you know just so i i i hope i live long enough mm. to be able to uh see you know dementia mm -hmm. wouldn't it be great wouldn't it be great if you could mm. really take the teeth out of dementia mm -hmm. wouldn't mm -hmm. it be great um and so yeah 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 i don't know and I think, again, you know, just kind of full circle, it all ties back to community, too. I mean, I loved how you talked about just the impact. I mean, yeah, there are so many people on it. And that community feels like it can go both ways. And I think we've obviously seen that in the last year, like the positive effects of what we need in community, what we can learn from each other, and how that actually impacts our brains, too, and helps it, makes it easier for us to kind of navigate through life, just the reward that comes from those social interactions. But now on the flip side, all the angst and antagonism, you know, even as you're talking about some of the COVID rifts that can also come from being in community. So, I mean, it's a little bit of both, but I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, like the research enterprise in a sense has, has seen that as well, uh, because oftentimes not to make it too global, but scientists obviously work in community too. We need community to kind of have innovative ideas and think about new ways of doing things. But I feel like people got a greater sense of that because sometimes people can just be like, well, this is my project. I'm going to go down this lane, laser focused, work on that but without having those tough touch points and interactions just how much harder it was for people to actually do that work in isolation um and mm -hmm. so in a sense it's it's like a um an awakening of those who are doing the work realizing oh yeah we also need that community too even though we may be studying these things we can't actually remove ourselves from the equation um and again i was just you know just thinking about you know as you're talking about your mom and some of those things like the importance of community just in terms of mental health like are we having conversations across the board with different folks who can actually inform how we talk about mental health. You know, are people trying to do one thing and talk about things in a better way, but actually making it more difficult for people who are kind of going through it. So I think it's all critically important. So as you yeah. continue in this work, any like any words of wisdom for, uh, for us as we, you know, try and think towards getting to a better place of just how we talk about and address mental health, like both the wellness aspect and some of the challenges. I mean, it drops a lot of nuggets already, but. Yeah, I mean, there's this moment where people go from being generous to being selfish. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's, it's amazing when there's someone in need, how people are like, oh, help that person. Mm -hmm. But then there's other ways in which it's like people pull back. And I think we have to, at the very least, see in ourselves when we're leaning forward and mm -hmm. when we're leaning back mm -hmm. with others, with ourselves too, I guess a little bit, but with others, meaning just, um, and I talk about this a lot when I give in speeches, like you can only do so much. Mm -hmm. You're only going to be as successful as you can be. You can do everything right. And the person you want to be helpful with, it's not going to work. Mm, yeah. So, the important thing is to mourn the loss of, you know, that 
whatever level of help you're trying to do mm. that isn't going to be whatever that whatever that piece is that's a failure more than the loss of that mm. and then help wow because then the quality of your help yeah. will be based in you know reality and based mm. in um agency of the person that you're mm. trying to help mm. uh which is really almost all the time like the only way it works <laughs> you know yeah. is if the person wants to move in their in their in a direction for themselves um you know and people have to protect themselves too because um you know you can try there's a lifeguard analogy where you swim out the lifeguard swims mm -hmm. out and then the person mm -hmm. drowns the lifeguard because they're yeah. spazzing out too much mm -hmm. that happens a lot in the mental health space mm -hmm. um so you know i think that was sort of the second half what i should have said first is like just be willing to think you know, to be willing to to engage these ideas. A lot of times the subject matter is so big mm -hmm. that people it's just too much to even think mm -hmm. about. Yeah. yeah. But if you if you sort of empower yourself that you can hear a little bit and that's enough, mm -hmm. you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to you don't have to overwhelm yourself. You don't have to commit yourself to a course of you're not going to be a physician, you know, you're in, yeah. you know. Yeah maybe there'll be useful piece of information if you open your eyes in a certain moment to a certain exchange that's happening or something like that. And maybe there won't, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think, I think people want, um, you know, a hundred percent return on time investment, mm -hmm. you know, Oprah rep rep recommends a book. You read that book, you get the value from that book, hundred percent return, you know, uh, it, it only works that sometimes way. people will go to a website or they'll go to a thing and they'll invest a little bit of time. Mm. And if there isn't return on that mm. investment, somehow it, that's experienced as, as a defeat mm. or as a, as an unwilling sacrifice. So I think if on the journey for our own mental wellness and for, I mostly think about others mm. for, our, for myself, you know, for everybody, communication is critical. Like you said, those kinds of conversations, sensitivities, it doesn't have to be conversations. If you just have sensitivities, um, I was watching an episode of friends. Oh, uh, I was making a juice and, uh, they, the thing that makes that show work is that they all, as, as they all lie to each other throughout 10 seasons, they lie to each other. they, they make mistakes at each other. They compromise each other, whatever. But ultimately what always brings those characters back to each other mm -hmm. is they're listening to each other yeah. and they are sensitive to each other. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we, if we're sensitive to our own words, when we're speaking to others. If we protect ourselves, if we recognize that we're really sensitive to what mm -hmm. somebody else is saying, yeah. Yeah. you know, somebody comes into your environment and you're like, I'm not going to like this person light me up right now. I'm just not going to let it happen. And, you know, then they say something, boom, and you're yeah, off to the races it. mentally. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you have to develop. Um, my wife's grandfather was always late grandfather. He died. He was 86. I think he died mm -hmm. 20 years ago, more than 20, 25 years ago. Um, I mean, 24 years ago. He, he was always MacGyvering stuff. You know what I mean? Like I, at one point I walked out in our garage, he was staying with us in our mm -hmm. little two bedroom house in Sherman Oaks because the, the winter in Indiana, he couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. So he came out with us and he was, and he would open the garage and sit in the chair, looking at traffic, looking at the traffic in the neighborhood. He, by seven 30, he could tell you everyone's business, Wow! <laughs> but he walked over to the tool chest and he had rigged up like a, a coat hanger, with a thing and another thing, and he and he was using it to hang his keys. <laughs> wow! And he, I looked at it and I was like, "This old timer has just like entertained himself yeah. with coming up with his little thing." And there were and a million things like that. If you went and looked at his toolbox in his shed in Indiana, mm -hmm. there were a million things like that. Yeah. I think our I think our mental health can be like that. We can come up with little strategies yeah. that will like help us in a moment or maybe it won't and or maybe it helped us at one point and it's not going to help us now and that's fine but that that um spirit of innovation yeah yeah that <laughs> that people have for objects if we find some way to do that with our mind you know i mean i suppose if you're add like how many times you where you put the things on the thing it matters or something but 
But you know, what if you what if you said something there and you say every time I see that, I'm gonna say I love myself. I mean, I don't know, whatever, but yeah, whatever is play these things play games, come up with with little um because what's fun is you'll get lost in it mm -hmm. in some little game, some little technique you're coming up with for yourself to be able to like, you know, pass the time yeah. and, and make yourself calm yourself or yeah. or get yourself like going, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, I I know um because I was sleeping late all the time, I could see where the, we had a palm tree in our back backyard and I could tell where the shadow was in the palm tree Wow! every day. <laughs> right. When I wake up, I'd look up and I'd be like, so bummed if the shadow was, <laughs> was over this way. Cause I knew it meant like I had slept, like it was past noon or something. And then, the, so what I would do is I would look out and when the palm tree got, when the shadow of the palm tree got to this one particular thing, I would get up and go run. Wow. I use the shadow of the palm tree yeah. as my prompt to get up and go run. It's so yeah. stupid. I don't think I've ever told no, anybody. It works. <laughs> right. So, and, but what happens you're is setting the rhythm for yourself and then your brain's expecting that. And then you're just going with it. And then someone will discover it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone will be like, they'll see you thinking about something or you'll, you'll be, there has to be a spirit of play is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. If you can have a spirit of play about your own, it can't just be about the struggle and mm -hmm. the, the thing. There has to be some way to engage other people. And I know like my wife and I, she'll see something and she'll go, you're doing that with that, aren't you? And I'll be like, <laughs> yeah. And like, well, it'll just, it's like a little husband and wife thing where like, yeah. she knows me. Yeah. She knows that I'm like setting, setting my mental clock or I'm, you know, petting my mental mood yeah. in a certain way that yeah. uh you know that she You're she appreciates yeah. yeah yeah i mean the so, research backs you up just having like that space to play or do other things like how, how resetting that is for us and just protective in a lot of ways and helps people kind of get through challenges too so your great grandfather he was he was on to something <laughs> yeah Oh my gosh. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and just, you know, all the insights that you shared. Uh, I know this, the listeners will enjoy kind of hearing what you've been up to in, in the path and just, you know, I, I really appreciate the way you personalized it too. Kind of took us on that journey. So thanks so much for taking the time <laughs> to jump on. Dr. The a, you are a beautiful it. human being. And I, I wish you every six continued success with the, um, with the podcast, with your family with your Definitely beautiful family it. and uh you know how to get a hold of me if you ever need me for anything 